I put the pro forma in front of a couple people. I didn't put it in front of everybody because I played the corporate America game. I kept that number close to my vest, right. holding it close to my heart. I don't want them to see how much imaginary money I'm going to make. Is right. that part of it? That was exactly all of it. <laughs> so let me guess, you rolled with 20%. I rolled with uh, 20% going into the business and I found out a very stuff. Welcome to the Small Business Safari, where I help guide you to avoid those traps pitfalls, and dangers that lurk when navigating the wild world of small business ownership. I'll share those gold nuggets of information and invite guests to help accelerate your ascent to that mountaintop of success. It's a jungle out there, and I want to help you traverse through the levels of owning your own business that can get you bogged down and distract you from hitting your own personal and professional goals. So strap in, Adventure Team, and let's take a ride through the safari and get you to the mountaintop. Guess we need to say cheers. Cheers. Glad to get back together. Yeah, always that was good a to fun. see you. Yeah, it's always good to be seen and always good to be hanging out with you. Hmm. So this time, I think our audience has told us it's pretty interesting to hear how we got started and how we had a plan. Are we going to talk about business plans? I think that's a good idea. Yeah, it is a business podcast. Let me ask you something. How many times have you heard, you know, some of the best business plans were done on the back of a cocktail napkin? More than I can count. Yeah. The old, if I had a nickel for every time I heard that. Right. What do you think about that? I think that's bullshit. (laughs) That's why we have an explicit rating, Chris. And that's why we have an explicit rating. I'm sorry, but you're right. (laughs) Yeah. I I have heard that. And I think, uh, I think that's completely 100% wrong. Yeah. Because if I didn't have the plan I had, I don't think I would have been as successful as I was early. And I wasn't really even successful early, but I would have been even worse and more failed if I would not worked my plan out. So I kind of put business plans into two buckets of use. And one is you have your business plan to pitch. You're going for financing. You're looking for support from your spouse. You're showing it to your friends. But then the other thing is, is it's your business plan, which is your blueprint of success for your own business. And I think a lot of people write a business plan for the first, but they don't really ever look at it again. Okay, they made their pitch, they got everybody to say yes, they got their money from their lender, and then the business plan goes in the drawer and they never see it again. I agree. Yeah. So I did not do the first one. Um, I did it to sell my wife. Uh, I was going to sell finance. So... I wasn't worried about having somebody else uh, look at it. I did it for the second part, and that's where the gold happens, and that's what I wrote in my book. By going through a methodical process of writing a business plan, so what are the elements of them? Well, I didn't know, so I said, i got to go get a business plan. And this, the Internet was out there, but not really out there. So you went to Barnes & Noble. I, I went to Barnes & Noble. I did buy a book there. <laughs> uh, I didn't find what I liked. And then I looked up on the smallbusinessadministration.org website, sba.org, and they had this thing called SCORE, and it's something, something of retired executives. And I'm sorry, SBA, but if you sponsor me and this podcast- <laughs> We'll learn what the other three letters mean. We'll learn what that is. Yeah. Uh, so I set up an appointment. I went to the SCORE, and I met with a retired executive who sat me down and said, what's your plan? And I uh, said, I don't know. And he gave me a business plan template. And I looked at it, and the very first thing you do with anything is have an executive summary. Right. So I sat there for a day going, how am I going to write the executive summary to something I don't know if I'm going to do or not? Well, you don't. You write the executive summary last. And that's the first thing that hit you me. You really think it's last? I do. Interesting. Because I had to have the idea. And that's I, true. Well, you went about this different than a lot of people who may be listening, right? I mean, okay, I'm a plumber. I want to start up my own plumbing business. I've been working for the man for too long. I want to do my own thing. So you know you're going to be a plumber. So when you're writing your executive summary, you start with it. There, yeah. Right. But in your case, how did you back into the executive summary? Well, after taking a day of going, I couldn't figure out what the executive summary was. I'm like, okay, what, what am I going to do? All right. I am going to be a professional handyman service company in the metro Atlanta area. That was my mission. Oh, was that a mission statement? No. It was the beginning. I'm like, okay, all right, what's chapter one? How are you going to market yourself? What makes you unique? I don't know. Good questions. Mm -hmm. Let's go find some people out and go look at that. Then the next thing was, how are you going to price your services? 
How are you going to convert your leads? How are you going to operationalize and fulfill on that promise of those leads? How are you going to keep track of this thing? And if it grows, how are you going to have a CRM? How are you going to have a billing and invoicing system? How are you going to be able to track this beast? How are you going to be able to, and in home services, how are you going to be able to resource what you need to be able to do the job? And I started going through all that stuff and I went, holy crap, I don't know any of that stuff yet. Well, there's a lot to think through. It is amazing when you actually start writing a business plan because sometimes that cocktail napkin, the genius of that is, is you get excited. Usually a cocktail napkin implies that you've had a cocktail. And right. So, right. So <laughs> infuse alcohol, number one. Yeah, which, which makes My you, idea for the trust toolbox came from alcohol. And it makes you better looking and smarter. Always. So then you have your great ideas and they get written on the back of the cocktail napkin. But when you actually sit down sober and less good looking and you start writing out all of these things, what is my competition doing? What's the, you know, the opportunity in the market? How am I going to source people? Suddenly you go, man, this, this is a big deal. And I'm sure, well, you went through quite a few different directions of but you looked at a number of di different businesses. Oh, you can say and it. Was it. The human hummingbird was all over the place. Right. I mean, the yeah. first six months of 2007, when I was trying to figure out what to do, I went. I did everything from looking at a community bank to starting a consulting practice to going back into manufacturing. And then... Well, was it the process of, of actually doing the business plan that helped you decide on the home services business and against some of these other things? Yes. Okay. That, that's a great question. It helped me because when I sat down to start writing to become a community bank and started working on the business plan, mm -hmm. again, great idea, fueled over alcohol with friends. Right. I was in the banking industry, but sobered up, looking at things at a very, and sobered up, not in the, I was drunk, but it sobered <laughs> up in the time to get to action, right? I realized there are a lot of missing components there. Yeah. And especially one of the big ones was how am I going to get the funding? How am I going to market and find people who want to go to this bank? I had no idea. No. And I also didn't have the passion to go figure it out. Right. And so that one went to the wayside because I started to realize that that wasn't going to work. And but the, the process of doing this can save you a ton of money from doing something rash. Because one of the things that I looked at when I had my golden parachute was also development. And it came from my wife and I were looking to buy a cabin. And we're up in North Georgia. We're looking at all these beautiful cabins. And we walked into one in particular, that beautiful cabin, unbelievable piece of property, fantastic view. There were no windows facing the view. <laughs> and, and I'm like, who is the idiot that bought this land and developed it and placed a house that was least likely to take advantage of this view? And I'm like, well, I can do better than that. So next thing you know, I'm talking to real estate people and I'm looking at land and all, I mean, and I had all my golden parachute money, I'm, I'm ready to jump in. But you, you know, then you start writing your plan and you realize I know nothing, <laughs> I know nothing about this. Right. Yeah. I, that's interesting you say that because I had a lot of money too. At least it looked like a lot of money on paper and to start up and fund what I was about to do, it looks like a big sum of money. Yeah. And I felt like I could do anything with it. And one of the things I learned early on was too much money does not make you financially responsible to your business and to what your mission is. <laughs> and I had to learn that, but we'll talk about that part later. Writing the business plan and going through those specifics and then using it to go find people who know more than you, that's where the gold happened for me. I started to write down all the people I considered mentors and people who were people I wanted to become. Small business owners, very successful small business owners, medium-sized business owners, which according to the SBA, would be small. So you were looking for these people to help you form the business plan or to pressure test it? So pressure test it, okay. exactly. I would write and I would go meet with, I go met with people who weren't even in the home services business when I started working on it and said, help me understand how you put together a performance plan. Help me understand how you pay guys on the job, not on the hour. Yeah. And I would ask them specific questions because it was specific to their niche. And then I would go ask other people who were, amazing at selling things in retail, which it still didn't hit me that I was about to go into a retail business, but I was asking them retail questions. And what I found from that was if you're interesting and you ask them specific questions, they'll give you specific answers. If you put the whole business plan in front of them and said, I'm going to start a handyman business, what do you think? Yeah. 
What do you think they all said? I don't have time. Why am I doing this? Yeah. yeah. Or Thanks sounds like a great idea. Right. Where's the coffee? Hey, yeah, knock yourself let, out, kid. Let me know what else I can do to help you. Right. Well, you didn't help me. All you did was say it was a great idea. In fact, I heard from more people than not in the beginning when I said this. I give them the business plan, sell them on it, talk about it without giving them details. Everybody said, can't miss. Oh, it's a winner. Oh, it's going to be a killer. <laughs> but when you started giving them details, they gave you detailed answers back, and you walk away going, hmm, that's a good point. I really don't have a CRM system. I need to find one. And I got to go find out what's out there and available to me in software. And that was a, a software consultant. And then I found him and I, I started asking him questions about software. Let's go ahead and thank one of our sponsors. Are you in the home service business and train your employees to represent your company in the right way and they're taking care of customers? Are they providing a 110% customer experience? If you aren't getting those rave reviews that you expect or those repeat customers that you crave, then you need to get the homeserviceinstitute.com training programs. These training programs talk the language of your technician and help them figure out how to align your goals with their wants. Go ahead and check out the homeserviceinstitute.com and all of their training modules, and they will turn your employees into 110% customer experience providers. That's the homeserviceinstitute.com. And now let's get back to listen to what the guys have to say. So maybe the smart way to talk about business plans is just kind of going from beginning to end. And they, they start with the same thing, the executive summary, which is essentially who you are and what you want to do and why you think there's a need. What was it in your executive summary or what was it about the market that told you that the trusted toolbox was something that could work? The first thing I did was I was in corporate America, just like you were. And I was swinging at that time at SunTrust. I was doing credit reporting for all of our analysts for our quarterly earnings calls. So I was swinging at that macro level and looking at all of the nation. So what did I do? I went to Harvard Business Review. I looked for some Harvard Business Studies and found it and pulled it out. The home services business is a $6 billion industry. It is. And all those numbers nationally were huge. And I'm like... Oh, Alan, all I need to do is get 0.1%. Right. And I'm a millionaire next year. Right. And then you started to realize that you can be big and be Wall Street level and macro level, but you've got to hurry up and get yourself down to Main Street level and how you're going to go from not making anything that's called zero dollars on day one mm -hmm. to being that millionaire. And that was the part of my scaling that was difficult to figure out and predict. And I kept going back to that living document called my business plan mm -hmm. every year always came back to it and then went back and then went back and iterated back and came back to the beginning and went back. But that's how I realized it was a big industry. But the thing that really told me it was going to be interesting was I realized everybody was franchising in the handyman business. Mm. And I said, if these guys who know how to franchise are going into this, this looks like a good business. All right. So where there was smoke, there was fire. Yeah. So what did you, what did you, what, what made you think you could do something different? How could you make a mark? Because basically if you're going up against franchisors, you know, you've got a lot of big fish in this pond. I was naive to think that I could go up against them. Now at the time, what I was up against was those big pockets and what I felt was a national brand that transitioned into a local presence. And what I did through some little bit of testing, which is another thing I wish I would have done a lot more of, but I did some focus group tests. So who were my target market? Well, I did a great job of figuring out my target market. So one of them, I put this in my book, was Terry Tennis from Ulta. The and tennis the, ladies. The tennis ladies from the Atlanta area. Ulta is that the largest. That might be the best gold nugget that you'll drop tonight is you got to check with the tennis ladies. You gotta, no matter what your business is. I think that one was the biggest gold <laughs> nugget of all yeah. was... They are ripe for the pickings, and I don't mean it the way you're all thinking. Nope. I know we're explicit, but that's not what I meant. Nope. I just want to make money off working on their house. That's right. So I got my wife, who was on an Ulta team. Ulta, for those not in Atlanta, I wrote this in my book, is the largest group of tennis associations, volunteer or whatever. It's, just some fight. it's the largest. It's the second largest tennis association in the United States behind the United States Tennis Association. Bingo. And it's just in one market. Atlanta. Right. And if you live here in Atlanta, you find out that, where do you live? And it always started out with swimming tennis. Yeah. Is that one word? Swimming swim tennis. Swimming tennis. Swim tennis. So I had her, uh, I wrote down three things. Uh, I said, take the ladies out after tennis 
and buy them a cocktail. Again, not a real hard play. And they go out for cocktail, and I asked them one question is, who was the last handyman you used? Can you name any handyman company that you would use if you had not used a handyman? What did you use the handyman for? And I know I said three, and I had the fourth one um, is give me a name that you think is pretty interesting. So I got all the information, and what I found out was some of the big franchisors out there, the ones I thought that there was no way I could compete against, they had no idea who they were. Right. No name. They all had a name of the guy that they used. Right. They knew Raul. They knew Jose. They knew Joe. They knew Bob but they didn't know the name of the company. Isn't that interesting? So I went, okay, so that's playing to my favor. So I asked her again later on to help me with the name too. Uh, and believe it or not, I picked the Trusted Toolbox and that came in second. What was their first choice? Can you tell me? One Day Pro. Oh, we can tell you. That's a pretty solid name. I know. Is, is it taken? Uh, it might be after somebody listens to this. <laughs> and I will say to you, Cheers and Royalties. good luck, and I'm yep. here to help. Yep. Cheers. If, if you need a consultant, give me a call. I will help you with it, but I am not taking that name. I've done my time, and I'm building the trusted toolbox. Yeah, it was really interesting to hear what they did, because the next thing I came back and uh, asked some questions about was, you know, price points and what would work and what, what they felt like was too much and what was enough. And I used that, that focus group, uh, those ladies, was very valuable for me. Do you wish, looking back on it, that there were some questions that you you wished you'd have asked? Yeah, there. Oh, there's so many questions in that business plan. Yeah, I went to ask. Uh, one of the things I was really afraid of, because you and I both know this, in corporate America, you didn't go find a mentor in the company who didn't want you to scratch his back or her back. That wasn't going to help you. When you went to talk to somebody in corporate America, they wanted to know what was in it for them, and you would pitch what's in it for them by having them know you because you could help them further their agenda. Very political, at least the worlds I was in. Yeah, and mine wasn't so much. That's interesting. Yeah, it was really uh, very political. I always had to figure out, the, again, the ulterior motive. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm coming to ask you for help. I'm coming to ask you for advice. But I'm also going to find out what I can do to help you because if, if I rise with you, then I go with you. What I found out here was in the, the small business world, was I could have asked a handyman in the business right now, just like anybody can come ask me, Chris, I want to come compete against you in Atlanta, and I'm going to do this. Bring it on. I'll, I'll spend 30 minutes with you, man. I'll show you everything. And I Would have. you really? I'd done it. Done it twice. Small handyman here in Atlanta said, Chris, do you mind if I come and pick your brain? I said, absolutely, man. Come on in. I well, said, Why I, are you so confident doing that? Because there's a lot of industries where people would never. Right. Yeah. This business is really effing hard. <laughs> So you're just, you're confident, like, I can tell them everything, but they still can't do it. You still have to execute. Yeah. And the execution is mind-boggling hard, way more than I thought it would be uh, to do what I do. Because we do so many things in the handyman business. And I think if I had to do it all over again, I would have asked people in the industry to critique my business plan and see if they give me any information. And I think a lot of them would have. The right people who are secure enough in their life. Hmm. And I, today... I'm that comfortable and that secure because it's just that hard. So like you said, you can go online and you can see the steps to a business plan. They're right there. And most people can come up with, okay, here's who I am. Here's what I'm going to do. Here's my unique selling proposition. We can talk about the value of mission statements and all of that stuff later. But when you get down to the nuts and bolts, when you're going for funding or when when you're trying to see if you have enough money to capitalize this on your own, you've got to do the pro forma. Here we go. Yep. Now we're down to the financials. Yeah, we're down to the financials. And man, that's where that statement that I've made before where entrepreneurs are fatally optimistic can really come to bite you. So what advice would you have for somebody who's trying to set up a pro forma? And I think, you know, I can start this off by saying it feels a little bit like a shot in the dark. You really have to do a lot of backing into these numbers, I think, you know, so how much money do I want to make and what's my profit margin going to be? So therefore, how much do I have to sell? What's my average job size? You know, how many leads do I need to get? What's my conversion percentage? All of those things 
But if you're starting from zero, if you want to start your own business, and in your case, you've never been in this industry. So if the plumber example I gave earlier, that guy's been working for somebody else. He knows how much the jobs are. He can probably back into those numbers a little easier. He may not know about the profit and cost of goods and things like that. But if you're starting from zero, how do you build that pro forma? How do you build that pro forma is a great question starting from zero. And that's why you, you actually led to it because you started in the franchise world with yours. I chose not to. That's where the franchise world will give you a leg up because you get to see everybody's financials early. Yeah, you see all the same stores and you know what they do and you can pull from their numbers and you can make some really educated guesses quickly, yeah. which and, is why you pay. The and I think if you're leaving corporate America and the franchising thing is on the table, I, I'm not saying no mm. and I'm not against it. In fact, we'll bring on franchise brokers. I love on. franchises. You just got to you got to be careful. You got to be careful. You got to yeah. pick the right team. You got to pick the right culture. But when you're going from zero, what do you do? That was one of my biggest failures because I put the pro forma in front of a couple people. I didn't put it in front of everybody because I played the corporate America game. I kept that number close to my vest, right. holding it close to my heart. I don't want them to see how much imaginary money I'm going to make. Is right. that part of it? That was exactly <laughs> all of it. So let me guess, you rolled with 20%. I rolled with uh, 20% going into the business and I found out a very stark <laughs> lesson yeah, three years later. How'd that go for you? Didn't exactly hit 20%. You'd be doing pretty well if you were at 20% right now, right? As as I mentioned earlier, 20% sounded great, but home services is not really a 20% business, as I found out later in life. Where'd you go wrong? What'd, what'd you miss? Let me put it that way. I missed the cost of what it took to actually deliver on what we did. I went with a high cost of goods sold. I had employees. I had trucks workers comp, general liability insurance, and I was not able to mark up my materials as much because anybody could go to Home Depot. And if I told them, hey, that plumbing fixture that you can buy for 35 bucks, I'm going to charge 70. <laughs> you can't get that number. And I'm or worth it. In the HVAC world, I can't buy that piece and then mark it up 80%. So it was all for me going to be on labor. It is a really good thing to discuss on how you're going to set your prices. And when you buy a franchise, often you'll buy a franchise in an industry that's pretty well known and you come in and you're the latest cheeseburger or you're the latest cupcake and you're going to charge a premium. And part of the reason why you have to charge this premium is because you're, you're paying these royalties. You have to cover your costs. The trade for that is, okay, you have this brand, we've got all this splashy marketing and there's always going to be something a little unique that allows you to charge more for that cupcake. But when nobody knows who you are and you don't have a brand, you can't price yourself above market. I couldn't price myself above market. Plus, I didn't know what market was yet. But we'll get to that part later. But, but, but you're not, but I mean, it's a good conversation because you're not worth it. And I think one of the things that people need to hear who are entrepreneurs is you know you're worth it and you know you're really good at what you do and you know that you really care and people should value that. But unfortunately, they don't. And so you have to go in, I think, and price yourself competitively enough because unfortunately, people shop with price first. They want to save value all, all day long. The only reason why they pay for something is because of a brand name. Ooh, because I mean, I can tell time with a Mickey Mouse watch. Why do I buy a Rolex? Because it's prestige and you know it's the best. Right. So they don't know that the trusted toolbox is the best when you first open up. You, no, nobody knew I was the best. Yeah. Uh, it reminds me of talking with Ellen Rohrer, who, uh, Ellen, you've, you've got to come on our show because I really want to hear about please, this. Please, Ellen. Please, I'm begging you. He's on his knees, Ellen. Please, <laughs> Ellen. So Ellen talks about being the plumber's wife and being able to charge what you're worth, but also you got to know your cost structure. And I think when we get her on, we'll talk about this. But I think in the beginning, your net profit, your profit is going to be very tight. But you got to know what your cost structure is. I didn't know what my cost structure was completely, but I also would not have been able to charge anything. You wouldn't let me come into your house and charge as a handyman $1,500 for one day if I only did three things. You'd be like, well, that's a waste of it. It wasn't a good value. And frankly, you're not worth it. So I think you do have to go out and do that. Which reminds me of an analogy that I have not brought up, but I'm going to bring this up before I've told my guys this. When I first started my business, I did a friends and family launch, and I asked one of my friends that if I if asked him if I could come in and work at his house. He said, "Not right now, buddy. I want to make sure you can figure out what you're doing before you come into my house." 
which was a nice way or a backhanded compliment, kind of smack in the face way of saying, you don't know what you're doing. Now what I tell my guys is everybody who starts a new business, it's kind of like that baby. They're a cute little baby. Oh, look at them. They're cute. They're cuddly. You want to talk them. And you put them up on your shoulder. And there's that one point where they're going to puke all over your shoulder. So when you work with somebody who's brand new in business, there's a chance that they're that nice, cute little baby. And it's going to be great and fun. But they have no idea what they're doing. And they might puke all over your shoulder. And as an established businessman, that costs me money. Right. So I had learned that story early, but that was uh, that was definitely something that happened early. Well, back in my enterprise days, when we opened in a new market as a you know major corporation, we never went in with the highest price. We were always a couple of bucks a day below the competition, and that way, anybody who didn't know about us and they're just purely shopping on price, and we felt like we were worth more. We actually knew we were worth more, but we couldn't charge more because they didn't know who we were. And so we charged a price that allowed people to feel comfortable giving us a shot. And then we would kill them with service. And then eventually we, you know, we'd establish our brand and then slowly our prices would creep up to where they'd be at or above market. So when you're building your pro forma, I don't think it's prudent to think that you're going to be able to get away unless you have some massive following you know, already who can't wait for you to, but you just, you can't do that. And I'm sure I've told you this story before. Um, I had the opportunity once to speak to some graduate students at Georgia State on entrepreneurship. And I sat on a panel and everybody on the panel, they were amazing. People from the SBA and and, uh, we had Artie Irani, who is, I don't know if he still is, but he was the CEO of Big Green Egg. Big Green Egg? Oh my God, we got to have another sponsor. Yeah. Big Green Egg, sponsor us, please. <laughs> I promise I'll cook on it. I, I promise actually, I'll tell everybody I love it. I, I told him, I go, you may need to get a restraining order on me because I am a huge fan. And <laughs> But the funny thing was, is here we are, all, we're in suits, we're at Georgia State, grad students. He rolls in, shirt unbuttoned, we're wearing suits. He's shirt unbuttoned, shirt untucked. And I'm like, this is not very impressive until he opened his mouth. And everything that came out of his mouth was just absolute gold to the point where I'm on the panel and I'm taking notes. So you're sitting in front of all these people, legs crossed, and you're taking notes. Yeah. I mean, they were, it was unbelievable. But one of the things he said about writing a business plan is when you're working on your pro forma, you need to be as conservative as you possibly can. And you need to pressure test it and you need to think about every line item. You cannot be overly optimistic. And when you're done with that, cut it in half and see how that feels. I needed to meet Artie before I started my business. <laughs> yeah, I did too. Because Artie would have helped me a ton. I know. <laughs> so cut the revenue in half and see if you can live on that. See if you can live on that. I think that would have probably made me put it away. I don't know about that. I, I look back on it, but that's a great pressure test. Well, it, most entrepreneurs will be like, yeah, somebody else can cut it in half. But, you know, what I've got is real gold. And you need to listen to these people. Your favorite line. What? just came to mind. What? As entrepreneurs, we are fatally optimistic. Entrepreneurs are fatally optimistic. It's just fatally like optimistic. Everybody people. that gets married thinks this is true love. This will last forever. Knowing full well the divorce rate's fifty percent. Got a buddy who's on number five. Going to be somebody else. <laughs> do you really? I do. Oh my God. Huh? Are you crazy? That yeah. is. How about that one? Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say a dog returning to his vomit, but that's probably not a good thing to say on the air. No, it, we might have to cut that. Maybe. Oh, maybe not. Maybe we're not. explicit. We are explicit. Now you just made us explicit. You can tell your son you just put us in the explicit category. <laughs> But back to Artie, he, I think he's right. I um, I had my plan. I did the 20%. I was holding it close to my vest, but I started to show a few people. And then three years later, I got a really good mentor, the guy I should have had before I started. And he asked me, and I got to really know him well. And he said, hey, how much uh, how much is your net? I mean, what are you pulling? I said, 20%. His eyes get as big as red Solo cups. He looks at me and says, really? I've been at this for 15 years. I've never gotten to 20 I said, well, you know, I'm probably missing a few things. And, uh, you know, here I start backtracking, realizing I'm not going to get good information. And he caught me in my lie. I said, ah, 10%. He goes, wow, 10, 10. That's, uh, that's been my best year I've ever had. 
I said, oh, okay, really, to be honest, it's 3%. He goes, yeah, that's probably what I thought too. So, you know, as you start your business and you're not, if you're not willing to share, you don't get good information back. And when you're starting your business plan, if you don't find people you can really bounce this stuff off of and not play that corporate America game of close to the best, share it with anybody. I said it earlier, I'll say it again. I am happy to tell everybody who wants to listen about the handyman business, and I have already done it. And I will tell them exactly how hard it is. And you can see all my books. And you need to share it with people that you know are negative and critical in nature. Don't show it to the yes people. Don't show it to those people because you know why you are? You're already the biggest yes fan you've got. And you're fatally optimistic. That's right. And you need somebody who's going to sit there and just shoot holes in it. When I laid out my handyman plan to everybody, everybody needs a handyman. It's a can't miss opportunity. Right. When I put my big macro level numbers on, so this is a six billion dollar industry. I'm going to make all I need to it's do a is get fragmented point zero. market. Everybody else is fat and happy, and yeah, all fragmented dumb. market, unprofessional yeah. needs to be consolidated. Franchises are trying it. You know, I can know I I, I can do this better. Oh, you can't miss, Chris. Only one guy, one guy told me. I don't know, man. You got to really watch your numbers. That's all he said. All I know is you really got to watch your numbers. It's those little whispers that you have to pay the most attention to, isn't it? And I looked at him and I walked away going, I'm smarter than you. I'm going to figure this out. I know my numbers. 20%. Ta-da! Wrong. So I took that pro forma because as we started the business planning process, why do you do it? You do it for financing. You do it to prove to your spouse you can do it or, you're, or you look to find family and friends financing, which is a huge no-no for me. Another now, conversation. Another conversation for probably the next episode uh, as we talk about how do you go get financing with your business plan. I was using it to find out information. So I was setting up road trips and field trips and going to see guys and, you know, asking them to come out and you know play a little golf with them on the weekends or, hey, go grab a beer with me after or can I get you for a coffee in the morning and asking these guys specific questions in their area of expertise. And that is where the gold was. You need to be interesting and fun to talk to. But if you ask them specific questions, they give you specific answers. And that was huge. And so that's where the business plan really started to come together. And I started to figure out a lot of those things. The advertising piece, the marketing piece, who are your avatars? Oh, that's a big word. That is. Right? In marketing and advertising, who are that? So I was figuring that out. And I had access to some really cool intel because in advertising, you can spend a lot of money. You can market to everybody, but you got to find out who's going to be your target market. So I figured that out. Uh, and I felt like I was good in that stuff, but there's a lot of stuff in that business plan. And you and I have talked about this before. Having that plan in front of you and start to pick at it, it's not a linear process. You got to go do a little bit of that, and that that being you can't see my hands. Um, yeah, they're going way left to right, by the way. And he's all over the board. Mm -hmm. I'm over to marketing, and then I would fly over to how many trucks do I need? Then I would go back to advertising, and then I would go to how am I going to be able to? Am I going to use QuickBooks? Am I going to use Petri accounting system? How am I going to account for all this? What's my chart of accounts look like? Oh, there's a question that most people don't even think about, right? Right. Yeah. My chart of accounts, as I set it up early, my CPA was golden. He did a good job. John Charles uh, helped me out a ton because I used a CPA who was also a small business owner. Mm. He said in the beginning, keep it simple, stupid. And I kept it simple for way too long, stupid. So I took his advice to heart. And what happened was later on in life, as I was trying to unravel this, I just picked the wrong bookkeeper to help me. <laughs> so keep it simple, stupid meant you are stupid. I, I kind of blew it. <laughs> but he was right. Put your revenue up here. Put your cost of goods sold here. Put your below the line expenses here and manage the big buckets and manage them tight. And that's a great lesson. Just like hiring slowly and firing quickly. And it's really easy to say. and It's really hard to do. Alan, I can go on for days about what I did in my business plan because I was grinding on that stuff 24-7. But, oh, by the way, I was still at the bank. I was still working 60 hours a week, still working on my business plan and asking all these people on the side all these different questions. And I was trying to get as much information that I could because I had a deadline in my head. I was out of here in six months, man. I'm taking my bonus money and I'm rolling. And if I don't do it, I won't do it. And then I started to back off it a little bit. And said, well, you know what? Maybe it's not the right time. 
maybe I shouldn't. And I went to one of my buddies and we were having a glass of wine again, common theme. And I said, you know, maybe I shouldn't do this yet. You know, I, I'm, I'm going through this stuff. And there's so many holes in my business plan that it's just not good. It's just, it, it doesn't look right. And he looked at me and said, buddy, if you don't do this now, you will never do it. Mm. And he said that. And I went, no, oh, no, I will. I will. You know, again, fatally optimistic. I will. But going back to that little inner voice told me at 65, Chris, did you want to say you stayed in corporate America all your life and provided for your family and did what you're supposed to do? And you're a good soldier. And that was a race well run. Or did you want to see if you were somebody who could actually do the entrepreneur thing that you thought you were going to do at 17? And that's why I got committed to it. And I started digging into that business plan just even harder. Well, and we've made a lot of jokes over even just the short few episodes that we've done that you're not very smart, but you really actually are pretty darn smart. You do have a master's degree, right? I do, do. I'm not a doctor, though. Yeah. I'm still not a doctor. You're not a doctor, but we won't hold that against you. But the fact that you worked so hard on this business plan before you needed to was genius because you use your business plan to actually help you determine what business to start, which I've never heard of anybody doing it that way. What I normally hear is people who have this grand idea and they want to start a business. And I'm like, have you done a business plan? And what they have is the cocktail napkin and they don't have the business plan. And when we started this conversation, we were talking about, you can use a business plan to get your funding, to convince your wife, but it really should be a living document. It's a blueprint for success for your business. But I think what we've kind of uncovered here a little bit is it's also something that is going to help you get the confidence that you can do this and be successful. Because by the time you really extrude this plan through the purification process that you went through, I mean, focus groups and everything, by the yeah. time you're done, I mean, you know what to do. You don't have to think about what to do next. Yeah. You've so got it all figured out. I had the can't miss opportunity. Right. And with that, Adventure Team, as we all know, this was a can't miss opportunity that took only 13 years to become an overnight success. <laughs> I'll see you next time. <laughs> bye bye. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Small Business Safari. Remember, your positive attitude will help you achieve that higher altitude you're looking for in the wild world of small business ownership. And until next time, make it a great day. Today.